In chapter 24, we're going to look at biological environmental indicators. So biological indicators using living things to indicate the health of the environment. Um, we mainly look at the presence or absence of particular kinds of organisms, but we can also look at the population of some different organisms as well to give us an indication of the environmental conditions. The plants, animals, microbes, invertebrates, all of these can be used at different times for indicators. Uh, plants can tell us a lot about both water and soil conditions, and we're going to look at some specifics in that in a moment. Um, for our biological indicators, we want to choose species with specific tolerance ranges, um, and especially tolerance ranges that we know a lot about. So there's no point choosing a generalist species like an ibis that can occur in really healthy or really poor, um, uh, or, we, or we can use them, but we just need to understand their tolerance range. There's no point choosing a species which we don't know the tolerance range for. So, um, Species with specific tolerance ranges are more reliable indicators. Um, and again, the number and changes of the different species that are present indicate changes in the actual system. So by looking at the changes of the species, we can understand the changes which, is, which are occurring in the system. So um, when we're talking about catchment health, we're talking about rivers and, and the waterways. Um, and so any change in water quality um, will affect the aquatic biological community, so the community of living things in the waterway. So therefore, the catchment health can be investigated by looking at the organisms that live within it. Um, a stressed system or a system which is polluted or has, um, has disturbances will see a reduced organism diversity, especially the loss of sensitive species. The reduced diversity and a loss of sensitive species show a stressed aquatic system. Um, and there will be an abundance of the tolerant groups, the pollution tolerant groups and species. So I was talking about ibis before, we can still use them, but we need to know that if we only see ibis, if there's an abundance of these pollutant tolerant groups like ibis as birds, for example, then we can get an understanding of, hey, if every other bird is disappeared but the ibis, we have some idea about what this system tells. This is the first um, uh, biological indicator we're going to talk about is bacteria. E. coli is one of the, um, the most used uh, bacterial indicators. So it comes from the intestines of humans and other warm-blooded um, mammals and, and other organisms. Um, and it can be used as an indicator of what other types of bacterial contaminations or pathogens would be there as well. So we know if there's E. coli, then we would assume there's lots of other things as well. Um, many different pathogens cause disease, um, but they are the difficult, difficult to detect, but E. coli is easy. We have lots of tests. We know exactly how to isolate it. We're very good at testing for E. coli. Um, so water runoff, sewage, septic overflows, domestic and stock animal waste, feces, um, all of these kind of stuff are sources for E. coli contamination. And so if you have a high levels of E. coli, that's a pretty good indicator that you've got polluted water. And that's used, that E. coli test is used all over Australia in all our waterways to test the health of our waterway. Frogs, frogs are a fantastic uh, biological indicator. They have very sensitive uh, they are very sensitive to environmental change because they have a permeable skin. It means that things move across their skin and into their body very easily, including pollutants. Um, so they can't control whether they enter or not. It's not like they can control whether they drink the water, the pollutants will just go in. Um, they're very easy to identify based on their distinctive calls. And if you have a low diversity of frogs, it ind indicates high pollution, and if you have lots of diversity of frogs, it indicates a low pollution level. So you're looking for the number of different species of frogs. Again, if you just have the same common frogs, like maybe the eastern common froglet or the striped marsh frog, if they're the only species you have, then you're probably looking at a quite polluted system. Um, so we're going to do a bit of work on this, and I'll give you the time, but when we get to it, there's an app called Frog ID. It's a Museum Australia app. Download this Frog ID app in preparation. 
filter the list of frogs to frogs near me, and then you can start exploring some of the frogs which might be around you, including some of the um, the more less, oh, sorry, the lesser known frogs like this beautiful golden bell frog, and there's some other really beautiful frogs that you can see there. Um, and you can begin starting to explore your local area, especially after all the rain we've had, record some of the frogs that you hear, and you can put them up there for experts to get back to you and identify what frogs they are, or you might even be able to identify them yourself. So we're gonna make sure we're doing a bit of frogging over the next few days. Um, same way that um, a diversity of frogs shows um, a good water quality, this, in the same way fish obviously show good water quality. So if you have poor water quality, you're gonna have a less diversity of species and fish and less, um, less populations of fish as well. So we've looked in detail at the example of the Murray cod um, and how the Murray cod was affected by eutrophication um, last year with the fish kills, if water quality decreases, then our, especially our native fish can be a good indicator of, of how polluted that system is. Um, they're easy to identify as well. Um, they're highly mobile, so they can avoid poor environmental conditions by swimming away. So if there is a particular area that is not is quite polluted, the fish will simply disappear. They can move away from that. So that lets us know where is and isn't polluted. Um, some of our um, smaller native fish, we don't have the best knowledge of their um, water quality tolerances. So that is a little bit of a downfall, but we do know a bit about the Murray cod. Needs clean water, lots of branches and other things in the water to hide under, but it also needs quite clear water. And so the lack of Murray cod in the Murray River can indicate turbid water in an unhealthy system. And we looked at turbidity already. Cool, uh, algae or phytoplankton, um, things that photosynthesize, um, small single-celled algae are indicators of the nutrient levels in a water body. So the limiting factor for plankton growth is not sunlight usually, it's usually the nutrient levels. Um, and so here you can see we've got some different types of phytoplankton. Desmids live in low nutrient areas. They can survive where there's very low nutrients, but as soon as there's too much nutrients, they're replaced by desmids. Uh, and you can see des... Uh, sorry, they're replaced by di diatoms. Um, diatoms replace desmids as nutrients increase. Um, and then as they increase even more, you begin to get um, green bacteria and then blue-green bacteria or cyanobacteria. Now cyanobacteria um, become overabundant and um, that's when you get the algal blooms and, you, and you've probably seen when there's been algal blooms in the Gippsland lakes and they close the lakes and can't swim in them that's because there's too much cyanobacteria within uh, within the water. Now algal blooms are natural uh, because Australia is a land of drought and flooding rain we have uh, lots of increase and decrease in flows increase and decrease in nutrient loads naturally um, however with farming and um, changing water flows and also an increase in um, extreme events with climate change, we're looking at um, an increase in algal blooms in our water system. Um, one of the main uh, biological environmental indicators that, it, that is used for water health or for aquatic environments is macroinvertebrates. These are small uh, insects but we can see them with our eye. And they're very easy to sample, they're very easy to identify, and they are really, really good indicators because many groups are widespread, so we can use this all over Australia. They're easy to find, as I just said. They can be identified meaningfully to a meaningful level. They live in water for long periods of their lives, so they're mainly just found in water. They're really important in the food chains as consumers. Um, so, because they're so important in the food chain, if they're, if, they're, if they're in large numbers, then it can support a wide range of, of other things like birds and, um, and other consumers and top predators. Um, and if they're not there, then the food chains will collapse. That's what it says here. They're food for many larger animals, such as frogs, fish and birds. Um, they're sensitive to, um, I don't know, milk pullets, I'm not sure about that. They're sensitive to pollute to 